our PHPP is largely complete at this point. As we talked about, we've input basically all of the information required in order to complete the assessment of our little building here. We've got all of our areas and windows and systems all roughly modeled in. Uh, we have Sure, we could dial in the performance of our heat pump systems a little more tightly. We could specify exactly the units that we're using. Uh, you know, that would all be important for certification, obviously. But by and large, we have most of the project roughed in in our PHPP. And so we're getting some real results now, and they are not so good. So if we go to our verification worksheet and we come down into our... Uh, Performance results here. Notice that our heating energy demand, our peak heat load, our cooling energy demand, dehumidification energy demand, our cooling peak load, uh, and our primary energy are all um, not very good. They are all um, not fulfilling our passive house criteria. So what's happening there? Let's take a look at how we can diagnose what the issues are, and then let's look at a couple of simple methods that we have for improving the performance of the building. So first of all, let's start with our heating energy demand. Why is our heating energy demand currently twice the passive house target? What is it that is driving us so far above that threshold? Well, the easiest way to find the issue with this um, uh, piece of our performance is to come into the heating worksheet. So I'm going to come over here to the heating worksheet. This is the monthly heating energy demand worksheet. And I'll click on this monthly heating energy demand worksheet. And this worksheet is going to give us all sorts of information about our building. We do not enter any information in this worksheet. We're just going to see some results. So for instance, I get to see some results on the uh, total transmission losses over the year. I get to see some results for the total ventilation losses over the year. I get to see some results for the total solar gain over the year. And I get to see some results for the total internal gains over the year. And then probably the first place that we want to look is this handy graph down at the bottom here. This is going to give us some useful information about our building uh, sort of at a glance. We don't have to go too in-depth. I'm going to zoom out a little more. This should really be a horizontal graph. Uh, anyway, what do we have here? We have all of our annual heating energy losses on the left. We say annual, it's really over the heating period. It's really in the winter. So this is our winter time heat losses. And then on the right, we have our winter time heat gains. And just right off the bat, on the, the losses side of the ledger here, notice that my this green piece is pretty big. 26 kilowatt hours per square meter per year. That's pretty high. For a typical single family home, that number should be more like seven to nine in a New York City climate. So that's pretty darn high. Why is that number so high? So that's the first thing that jumps out at me is that the ventilation losses look pretty large compared to what they should be for a certified passive house. Additionally, maybe you could look at some of the others. Why is this? What is this? The floor slab? Why is the floor slab so large? The floor slab is fully like 30% of the external wall losses. Why is the floor slab so bad? So maybe we might need to go and take a look at our assembly there, make sure we have enough insulation in the floor, um, etc. But let's take a look at the ventilation first. So this is the first one that jumps out at me, and then we can come back and sort of talk about some of the rest of them there. Let's see what's happening with the ventilation. Why is ventilation so bad? So let's come up to the top here and let's take a look at how that ventilation annual losses value is getting calculated. So right here, here's our here's their calculation of the annual ventilation losses. And notice right here, 26.4 kilowatt hours per square meter per year. That equates to about 3,000 kilowatt hours, 29,000 or 2,900 kilowatt hours. Okay, well, why is that? So that's it's a simple calculation. You just take the volume times the N-equiv times C air, that's a constant, times your climate data, gives you that 3,000. So you can't change the volume. That seems right. That's, that's the right volume. You can't change the heating capacity of air. You can't change your climate. So the, the, the only variable here is this N-equiv. This is the, um, this is the, um, 
energetically effective air change rate, and it's currently set at 0.4, which is pretty high. Why is it at 0.4? What's what's happening there? So that's a pretty high um, air change rate at uh, at rest. So what is it that's driving that number? Why is that so bad? Well, in order to determine that, we could look in a couple of different places. So we could, first of all, start in our additional ventilation worksheet, and we could um, sort of take a look at uh, some of the inputs here. We could make sure that we have all the right information in our ventilation worksheet, so in our additional ventilation worksheet. So make sure that all these numbers are correct. That's, that's important. And then the other place that we would look would be in our uh, traditional ventilation worksheet uh, and make sure that things like our uh, volumes are being input correctly. And it looks like those are all correct. It looks like we have the right wind protection coefficient. We have the right um, wind, uh, uh, E and F coefficients. And here we go. Here's the problem right here. Whoops. Why is this a problem? Why am I saying this is a problem? We currently have input an air change rate, a tested N50, an air change rate of 4.42. Hmm. Let's go back to our verification worksheet for a second. So 4.4. 4.42. That's our pressurization test result. Remember, the target for passive house is 0 0.6. So we currently have a extremely high air change rate input for our building. 4.4 is terrible. Nobody should build a building to 4.4 ACH anymore. Uh, okay, so why is it coming in at 4.4? Where'd that number come from? It's a very specific number. How did that number get determined? Well, that number is coming from the defaults that we set up back in our honeybee scene. Remember, we haven't ever we have not ever set this information. We have never gone in and actually told PHPP what this number should be. So it's calculating this number based on the honeybee program information. What does that mean? Well, let's go back to our honeybee scene for just a second. Uh, I'm going to come in here and let me come way back. Let me come all the way back to my second floor zone. So remember, way back in the beginning, when we created our honeybee zones, we created a room, and the room had an input for a program. So in honeybee speak, we can input what's known as a program here. A program is a collection of um, settings, an occupancy rate, a lighting installed power density rate, a ventilation flow rate, and also an infiltration flow rate. So by default, unless we tell it something else, Honeybee is going to assume that our building has a program of small office building. And a small office building has, associated with it, a certain infiltration air leakage rate. Now we can see what that is by using some of the native Honeybee tools. So if I come up here to, let's see, to Honeybee, and actually, I think I want Honeybee Energy, and I think we can get it here under, where do we get it? Uh, deconstruct, deconstruct Ventilation, I think. Oh, no, that's not it. No, what we want to do, let's see, this is, all, this is all different, of course, in the new the new honeybee here. Uh, okay, so what I need to do is I need to get the program for this room. So I can come over here and I can say room attributes, get the program, that's good. And so I'll come to back to honeybee. And let's room attributes. Nope, not that one. Sure, we'll do it this way. We'll take the room, get the room, get the attribute, get the attribute. And what do we get as a value? There we go. So the program which was applied to this room is generic office program. And so if I put generic office program into this deconstruct program, what do we get? We get some, uh, we get a whole bunch of information here about things like ventilation. So these are the, again, the, these are the defaults which have been applied to this. Uh, we have a certain amount of airflow per person, a certain amount of airflow by area. We have a certain 
um, you know, occupancy rate, which has been applied to this program, again, all by default, right? If we, because we haven't given it any other information here in program, it's going to apply all of this small office stuff by default. Notice one of the things that it applies is an infiltration rate. So we have a, we have a infiltration rate, 0.00227 cubic meters per second per square meter of envelope area. So that's per square meter of above ground exposed area, I believe. Um, uh, that's going to be the default infiltration rate for a generic office building. Okay, so that's where that number is coming from. So if you were to take this number and you were to do the math all the way out, what you would find is that that equates to 4.4, 4.42, Four point four two air changes at fifty pascals. Right, so there's a whole bunch of conversions happening in the background, and that's all getting converted over. Okay, fine. So, so that's where that number comes from. So, how are we going to reset that number? Well, there's two ways that we could reset that number. We could either set up a new Honeybee program. So we could come in here to our program and we could build or blend a new program with new infiltration values. So we could change this number and we could apply that new load to the room. That would be one method. So we could absolutely do it that way. Or we could use one of the built-in uh, passive house tools in the PH tools ribbon. If we were to come into O1 model, notice that we already have a component here for air tightness, which is going to do all of that program creation and assignment for you. So we've sort of bundled up all of that stuff into a component here, which is this Ladybug Tools air tightness component. So let me go ahead and drop that onto the canvas. Notice it's pretty, uh, pretty small. It's going to take in a series of honeybee rooms. It's going to take in an N50 value and a, a blower door pressure rate. So we could use this, um, I think, just about anywhere. I'm going to use it. Uh, let's use it all the way in, all the way at the end over here. Let's make a new. Let's make a new section. Actually, let's make a new section, and let's call this. So I'm so I'm right before my model configuration after domestic hot water. And what do we want to call this? We'll call this um, natural airflow. Is that the right? terminology? I don't know. I guess I should make it uppercase like everything else. We'll call it natural airflow. I'll try and call it natural airflow. Let's see if I can type it properly. So this will be our, this is our tested air infiltration. And so all we need to do is we're going to take in some honeybee rooms and we're going to kick out some honeybee rooms. So I'm going to take honeybee rooms from the previous link in the chain. And now we can apply some information. So let's say that we want to set our tested air tightness, our ACH, to 0 0.6. Let's say we're doing a new construction, um, uh, passive house classic style building. We can put in 0 0.6 ACH. Uh, by default, it's going to assume 50 pascals of pressure. If you're doing something different, uh, if you're if you need to be inputting information at 75 pascals, you can certainly do that, and it'll do all the conversion there. Um, you could leave it blank, uh, or you could you know make it explicit by adding that in. Okay, so that's done a bunch of it's done a bunch of um, calculations, and what we get out are honeybee rooms with that new information added to them. So I take that honeybee rooms and I pass it to the to the next link in the chain. I could put this just about anywhere, I think, and it would work. And if we go back to our PHPP, notice this has now been properly set to 0 0.6. Let's go back. Let's now go to our um, heating worksheet. And if we scroll down to the bottom, there we go. Notice our ventilation losses are much smaller now. They were at like 26 or something before. Now they're down at like 9.8. We could probably improve that a little bit by adding some insulation to our ducting and making our ducting a little shorter and lowering the flow rates and maybe do better than 0.6. There's some other things we could do to improve that, but that was a big one right there. Right, so that knocked a huge amount of our heating energy demand away. Uh, out, notice now our heating energy demand is down to 16. Go back to our verification worksheet. 
We are currently at 16 kilowatt hours per square meter per year. Our target is 15. So we're in much better shape now, right? We're within striking distance. We can tweak our insulation levels. We can tweak some of our ventilation system components. Um, you know, it's not that much of a lift to go from 16 to 15. Um, a big chunk of it was that air tightness. So configuring your air tightness, super important. There are different ways to do it. Um, you could certainly build your own uh, programs, or you can just use this little out-of-the-box uh, component that we have here for air tightness. So hopefully that worked for you. Let me go back to the PHPP for a second. It obviously worked well for our heating load and our annual heating energy demand. It didn't do anything really for our cooling, however. So when we come back in the next video, what I'd like to do is turn our attention to uh, natural ventilation as it, as it pertains to cooling. As I said in our previous video, currently the PHPP thinks that we have a totally closed box with no operable windows. So we need to fix that. We need to tell PHPP that we in fact do have quite a lot of operable windows and we need to enter some information for those. Uh, that'll obviously have a, a strong impact on our cooling energy and our cooling peak load as well. So we'll finish that up in the next video. We'll come back and take a look at how to add the, that to our Grasshopper and PHPP model.